Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I'm not well-spoken. I don't know enough. I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing. I'm not the best person to do this. I'm sure there's someone better. What if they reject what I have to say? What if they don't like me anymore? What if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer? I am afraid. Do any of these thoughts sound familiar to you? Perhaps they've echoed in your own mind at the thought of sharing your faith with other people. Perhaps, more than we care to admit, we hope that no one asks us about our faith to give an account or, as Peter says, a reason for the hope that is within us, because we're afraid of what that might mean. We're afraid of what it might do to our relationships, our reputation. We're afraid of what it might cost us. Well, if this is you, you're in good company. I've had these thoughts and fears, and still do. Many Christians, including the ones who you can think of that do an excellent job you think of proclaiming Christ, wrestle with all of these thoughts as well. You aren't alone, and in all likelihood you are putting more pressure on yourself than Jesus himself intends. Today we have a text of Jesus sending out the 72, just as he sends us out. And what does he send them to do? He sends them to proclaim the kingdom of God has come near to you. We can learn a few things about what we ought to do today from looking at the instructions Jesus gives these 72 men he sends to go before him. And this is very much needed in our day and age, just as much as it was needed back then before the church really formally even began, when Jesus was beginning his earthly ministry, when he set his face to Jerusalem, even now the reality is the same. We live in a world of people who need Jesus. And for some strange reason, God has chosen broken yet redeemed people like us to bring his word to those people so they too may hear that the kingdom of God has come near to them. It's also important because in our day and age, at least in our country and in our synod, there aren't enough laborers for the harvest field. From both our seminaries this year, we graduated a total of, I think, something like mid-80s students. And nearly 50 congregations who were seeking a pastor were unable to get one because there were too few. And yet Jesus continues to send us just the same. But are we listening to him? Now, that doesn't mean that everyone is meant to go into professional church work. That's one of many vocations that God uses in the manner in which we're about to read. But it is one to consider and to pay attention to. Because we still need to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near for those who don't yet know. So Jesus sends out the 72, and he does it seemingly with them being totally unprotected. The phrase he uses to describe this is he sends them out as lambs in the midst of wolves. That confrontation that never goes well for the lamb. It's a frightening image. And then he makes it clear that he really means that when he says, don't take anything with you. Go with all, only what you have on you now. No money, no extra clothes, no provisions. Don't even greet people on the road, which was a normal custom of the time because he's giving them a new way, a new way to greet people. But why would he do that? 
Well, we heard it from the mouths of our children this morning. He wants to teach them to put all worldly cares behind them and to rely on Him alone and on the provision that He will provide for them through the people He sends them to. So off they go with this message from Jesus, not armed with weapons, clothes, extra clothes, or provisions, but simply with some simple words. What might that look like for us today? Not necessarily a literal behind, leaving behind of all your stuff, although depending on what's preventing you from doing what God is calling you, that may be what He's asking of you in some way. And in many cases, many of you probably have left material things behind in pursuit of God's call in your life. But it's a tough thing being willing to trust God completely with your life, your reputation, and well-being. Because that means that we go, according to our own eyes, seemingly unprotected, out with God's Word. But if we think about it, how else can we risk speaking about Christ unless we're willing to leave those things behind? If I love my reputation too much, it will stop my mouth when it shouldn't. If I'm worried about advancement in my career, it'll stop my mouth when it shouldn't. If I'm afraid for my own sake of losing a friendship or straining a family relationship more than I do care about them hearing the word of Jesus, it'll stop my mouth when it shouldn't. You might be rejected. In fact, as we get into the text more, we'll see that Jesus knows this is going to happen and, in fact, plans something for it. You may lose a friendship, or maybe you already have because of your faith. You may strain a relationship. Maybe it already has. But Jesus calls us, and we must be ready for such realities. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, Pastor, your pitch for witnessing is backfiring. All those thoughts you mentioned at the beginning are louder than they were before, and now I'm even less likely to go. But let's look at what Jesus arms them with. Not the things that we recognize and the things that we, in our fears, run to security from. But he doesn't send them out alone. So he sends them and they go, no provisions, not greeting anyone on the road, but then he instructs them that when you enter a home, I have a new greeting for you to give them. Simply say, peace be to this house. And he says, if there's a son of peace there, your peace will rest on him, and if there isn't, it will be returned to you. It's a strange turn of phrase. See, often... We think of evangelism as our own work. And if that's our view, then this scripture makes no sense. Simply saying, peace be with you, and if a son of peace is there, it will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. What about the articulate, loquacious argument that I can make for why you should believe in Jesus? What about the debate and the persuasive endeavor of using rational and logical argumentation to convince someone they really ought to believe in Jesus. It's so much better. Notice that that's missing. And that often is the source of pressure we place upon ourselves when we think we're being called to share our faith. It's on me to say things correctly. It's on me to be persuasive. It's on me to win people to Christ. It's not. You simply say the word that you've been given. Peace be to this house. And if they receive you, he says, remain in that house and eat what they give you. This he likens to the wages of the laborer, right? This is a labor. It is something that requires work, and so they need to be sustained, especially since he told them not to bring any provisions with them. And here our Lord is going to provide. 
And then he says, do not go from house to house, which is sort of a strange phrase. What does that have to do with anything? Shouldn't I tell more people about Jesus? But really what he's getting at here is he wants to guard these 72, and he does this again later at the end of our gospel reading, from becoming puffed up and conceited and searching for glory for themselves. Because how great would it be if you could go to all these houses and accumulate the wealth of what's being offered to you? Or gather a large following and think that, oh, man, I must be a really good evangelist for Jesus. Look how many people have heard about him. And then later on when they come back, they're all excited because they're like, Lord, even the demons were subject to our authority when we used your name. How amazing is that? And, and Jesus kind of throws a little cold water on that and says, even though I've given you this authority, don't rejoice in this. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven, that you are saved, that your name is in the book of life. So, humility, no self-glory in this task. And many of you who've served others in the name of Christ know that often it feels like it goes unnoticed, certainly unthanked. But every once in a while, it's recognized. I used to tell my dad when I was a kid, my dad's a pastor, and I used to tell him, yeah, pastors either get treated better than they deserve or worse than they deserve. But really, that's kind of the nature of the gig, not just for pastors, but for all who bear the name of Jesus and His Word. So now they're sent out, they're at a house, They've been received, and what are they supposed to do if they've been received? Heal the sick in that town and say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. If you, and by extension Christ, so one of the themes in here is that you who bear Christ are representative of Him, and so accepted or rejected is the accepting or rejecting of Christ, the receiving of Christ. And say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So what does that look like today? Am I telling you to go around at any time you enter somebody's home, look them square in the face and say, peace be to this house? Well, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. They may look at it a little funny. Might be a nice conversation starter particularly for your friends who don't know Jesus, the kingdom of God has come near to you. There's a lot in that small phrase. And remember, at the very beginning of this section, it says that he sends them to all the places where he himself is about to go. Jesus follows up everywhere the 72 go. The kingdom of God is at hand in Jesus. This is what we heard from John the Baptist before his public ministry began. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is fully found in Jesus. Now, what does that look like today? If somebody has cancer, can I go and heal them? I could. The Lord certainly could work that way, and I've heard stories in other places where it seems like He certainly does still. Yet, Often, he chooses to work another way through doctors and nurses, medical professionals, who are fulfilling their vocation, their calling from Christ to bring the kingdom of God near to them. But not just that, but here when we gather around the gifts of God. See, we're always focused on starting churches and forming a church wherever we go because in the church where the people of God gather, where the ministers are called, is where this healing takes place. Not just healing from earthly ailments and diseases. That's not why we call Jesus the great physician. We call him the great physician for he heals the disease that no one else can, the disease of sin and death. That's why you're here, to receive that word, to receive those gifts. The promise of your baptism when the water was placed upon your head. The promise 
of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross when you gather around his table to receive his body and blood. And so we go out and implore people to come join us where the Lord has come to bring those things to bear, that healing. The kingdom of God has come near to you, we tell them. Now notice again here, there is no call to debate, persuasion, rational argumentation, using fancy words, but simply to say the word that you've been given by Jesus. The kingdom of God has come near to you. Share Jesus. That's our basic instruction. And he has given you a word to say. And it's not your word. So don't put that pressure on yourself. It's his. And it does its own work, just like it did for you. You see, we believe that people come to faith as a gift, a gift given by the Holy Spirit, which is a great joy to us, although sometimes a frustration, because maybe you've been working on somebody in your life, and you're thinking, I've been doing all of this, Pastor, but the Holy Spirit just won't inform me what the timeline is here about when He's going to do something with that. And that's true. But again, we go back to the humility and no self-glory piece. That sort of comes with that territory. That isn't our job. We're not able to do it. And thank God it isn't our job because then your fears would be justified. Your fear of saying the wrong thing, of ruining the hope of the gospel for somebody. At the seminary, I had a lecture with Professor Bierman, who's sort of infamous in that he is pretty straightforward. There's probably a reason that he's at the seminary, not in a, in a parish. But it has its place, and he had this beginning of this lecture, we were talking about preaching, and he started out by saying, you're not that important. The first thing he said for the, for the whole lecture was that. And so you're sitting there thinking, okay, well, where, where is he going with this? And the point he was making is that if you make a bad sermon, and you will, the church will survive. The message of the gospel will still be proclaimed. It's one of the joys of the liturgy, right? Maybe you didn't get much from my sermon today or last week. That's okay. The liturgy proclaims the glory and word of Christ when I fail to do so. And he does the same for you when you fail to do so. It's not on you. It's not on your words. You're not the only one God is sending. But now we get to the hard part. What about rejection? Jesus seems to know what's going to happen. He gives them a plan. So we talked about the towns that receive these 72 and what they should do, but what about if they are not received? What if they're rejected? And here's what he says. Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. And then there's a few verses of really harsh judgment statements. That it'll be worse for this town than for Sodom. And if you're not familiar with that story, Sodom got burned completely from fire, with fire from heaven. So for those that reject Jesus, because by rejecting those he sends, they reject him, it'll be worse for them on that day. But notice that they don't just say, well, thanks for nothing, we're wiping our feet off, you're on your own. At the end of that, what does it say? It says, nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. So the word is given, that same word is given, whether they were accepted by the town or rejected by the town. Because again, what that word is going to do to those who hear, is not up to the 72, but up to God. So notice again, even in the course of rejection, there's no rational, logical debate that takes place, nor a command to engage in such discourse. Now, I'm not saying that has no place. It has its place. And certainly among believers for the deepening of faith and for the encouraging of faith, 
but the work of salvation is Christ alone. And it carries it out through, he carries it out through his word. The very same way you were brought to faith. For if someone were to ask you, why do you believe in Jesus? The answer is that he gave me the gift of faith via the Holy Spirit, which came through hearing the word that was given. And so we go out the same. But your fears about rejection, it turns out, they're justified. It might happen. For some of you, maybe it already has. There's no sense in pretending otherwise, because we're sheep sent out in the midst of wolves. Sometimes that doesn't go so well. So why go? Why should we answer this call? I mean, the short Sunday school answer would be, well, God asked us to, so that should be enough. But sometimes it isn't, is it? The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The purpose for which you are sent is so that others may hear the word of Christ, the greatest gift and treasure that can be given from one human being to another. You might be the only person they may ever hear about Jesus from. Who knows? Now, before you start lumping all that pressure on yourself, remember that to hear about Jesus from you is just to give the simple word. Jesus loves you. He cares about you. Not fanciful arguments or large, sophisticated-sounding theological words. This is the way our Lord has chosen to become known to the nations, through you and through me, sharing the word, trusting in Him, So, dear friends in Christ, you are important. The church is important. Now, not in the way that you think. You're not important for your intelligence, for your ability to speak well or strong, rational thinking capabilities, although you may have some of those. And there are certainly blessings. But why do you think Jesus was so concerned with preventing the 72 from becoming puffed up in their own ability to do what he asked. They would start to think it was their idea. Now, those are blessings for sure, but if we don't measure up to our own expectations of those, it will stop our mouths cold. And if we think we're fit with those things, too often it leads to earthly glory. Pastors aren't immune from this. You've probably heard many stories over the years of pastors who fall prey to their own abilities and speaking and start to think that it's their own idea. No, what makes you important is what you now carry with you, not something of your own making, but a gift given, the very word of Jesus himself. So, dear friends in Christ, the risk is worth it. I wager all of you have thought about a person or two through the course of this sermon somebody who you've got some guilt about maybe not sharing God's word with, or maybe you've been in an ongoing attempt and it seems like it's not working out. The risk is worth it. You see, in that one verse there, verse 16, we often focus on the rejection part. But look at the very beginning. The one who hears you hears me. When people hear you, They hear Jesus. That's a great gift. The risk is worth it. The risk is worth taking because the risk really isn't for you. As we learn, Jesus goes with us wherever we go. You're saved by the faith that you've been given in Christ. Your salvation is sure. So we take the risk, secure in that promise of faith, so that others can hear Jesus. That's it, plain and simple. So today, in conclusion, I'm going to share that very word with you. Jesus loves you. He died for you. So that your sins, all of them, no longer condemn you. You have forgiveness and eternal life 
is a free gift of His love and grace. Let's share this word. Let's tell others so they can hear Christ and can enjoy the wondrous blessing of that forgiveness, that hope, the meaning, and life eternal we have in Him. You and I can't do that. Only Jesus can. So let's share Him. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus as you go out to share Him with those that He places in your lives until He comes again to make everything new. In His name. Amen.